this is all I've done for 40 years. Airplanes. I love airplanes. I love aviation. I love teaching. But more than anything else, I have enjoyed in the last 40 years representing people on accidents, bombings, the Pan Am bombing. This case, just, this shouldn't happen to just ordinary people. There were 80 children on that plane. People called me and said, you do aviation stuff. Yes, we want to hire you to do this. And I told them I would. In the European Court of Human Rights, we filed back in 2016. It took quite a while to gather enough of the actual documents, most of which were online, in order to make a good factual, good factual allegations against the Russian state. Uh, there's very little that happened until a year ago, September, when Russia was required to answer, and they did. Most of what they had to say about the court case and about what we alleged that they committed this act and how they did it, from my viewpoint, is not very good evidence. The same conspiracy theories they've been talking about since the beginning, the same blame on Ukraine. The way I view it is that the evidence is overwhelming. They were seen, they were recorded, they were videoed and photographed, they were recorded on intercepted telecommunications. It was their weapon. It was found at the scene of the crime, literally. It was found amongst the wreckage of the aircraft and the shrapnel that was removed from the bodies of the victims was characteristic of the, the girdle of shrapnel which surrounds the warhead on that particular model of the Buk missile. So it's, it's, it's very much like a criminal case in the sense that we think we know why they did it, we certainly know how they did it, we know where they came from, and we found a weapon. And so the, the, the case in the European Court of Human Rights is about violating all of those individuals' right to live. And what will happen now is we have until December to file a reply. We file a suit, they answer it, they say no to everything. And then we file a reply that says your, basically your, your denials, your answers, you're saying that you didn't do it. It doesn't match the evidence. And when all of that is in front of the court, the court will, the European court will determine whether it's seen by a small panel of judges or whether it's seen by the full European Court, which I believe is 33, and they will determine whether they want an evidentiary hearing or whether they want simply to rule on the evidence that has been filed, the documentary evidence, the videos, the photographs. And they'll tell us what they're going to do. So I, I would say probably sometime the middle of next year the court will contact us and say this is where we go from here. We have everybody's input and we're either going to have a hearing or we're going to rule. Uh, th they could say that next year and it still could be a couple years before they actually do it. The problem with the European court is that it has such a heavy backlog of cases that you wait in line, kind of like waiting COVID-19. You stand in line for long periods of time and you wait and that's interrupted by periods of great activity and a lot of research and a lot of writing. And uh, right now we've gotten some extra time because of COVID-19. Uh, uh, the court itself has been closed in Strasbourg for quite a while and they're going to reopen again in the fall and then we'll start up. Th there are several procedural requirements. There are also exceptions to those requirements. Uh, exhaustion is the rule that says you have to sue the defendant in the defendant's state before you can come here. The exception to that is if the defendant's state's conduct is such that they did not investigate themselves, that they did not participate in any official investigations, if they withheld evidence such as witnesses or documents, which they did both, they lost the raw radar data from the closest radar station that would have recorded what actually happened. Um, they have constructed evidence out of thin air about jet fighters, about all sorts of things.
about the location of additional missile batteries that were not Russian. All of that is falsified. It's disinformation. It's what they do. And they do it, and they do it, and they do it. And the court has to decide whether or not we satisfy that exhaustion. Because if they do all those kinds of things, then we are relieved of the responsibility of having to go there. There's also the small fact that no complaint has ever been filed against Russia, the Russian state in a Russian court, where a verdict was in favor of the people filing the complaint, the plaintiffs. And the lawyers almost never survive the case. It's amazing how many get shot in subways and poisoned. So there's, we didn't have to exhaust ourselves because of their conduct and there's physical danger to the parties and their lawyers and we have pled both of those as reasons why we started in the European Court of, as opposed to starting in Russia. I, I'm very pleased that, that the Dutch have done several things. They intervened in our case. They filed their own state claim against the Russian Federation, Netherlands versus Russia Federation. That gives us more powerful allies. It gives more workers. Uh, the Dutch state has people who can work on it. It also gives us credibility that our case is believed by the most affected state. Well, I can't say that, but the most people in the plane came from, from the Netherlands, and the Netherlands is standing up for their people, and I think that's very good. What is happening in, in the court so far is that the, the, the legal representatives for the Russian defendant Pulitov have been creating delays. They're going to run out of things to delay and then it will pick up some speed. But we hope by next spring that the substantive allegations of the case and the evidence supporting it will be in front of the court. Um, we're hopeful that by the end of next year that it will be complete. We'll see. It's going to be, it's going to be probably close to two years anyway. They stepped into the European court because all of our, all of their citizens, almost every one of them stepped up and they felt that they had to represent their, their people and take action. And I admire that. Not every state will do that for its people. But they also, if you think about what the Netherlands has paid for the investigation, they, they paid for the expenses of bringing everybody home, of taking care of the families. Uh, the, the country's been disrupted significantly. The only thing I can compare it to is, is uh, I, I was in New York right after 9-11, and it was a shock to everybody. And this was 9-11 to the Dutch. And they're, they're serious. They're serious people. And if the Russians think they're going to walk away from this anytime soon because Russia's big and scary, I think they're wrong. The Dutch are, they got guts. They're good. These four people are important because they're kind of middle-level management. They were on the spot, but they had enough authority to make decisions and to do logistics, to move the missile around, to get it in place, to do those things. Above them are the people who made the decision to attack an aircraft, and those people should be held responsible. It could not have been a mistake. They, they, it's too sophisticated a weapon system. It's got nearly a 100% effective Ability. I mean, 99.99% .99 of the targets targeted are hit, and they can see, and they can radar paint them. And plus, why else would you go to a location on a commercial aircraft corridor where there has been no military action and no military planes? You sit in the middle of a road, you get run over by a car. You sit on a commercial airline corridor, and commercial flights go overhead. That's part and parcel of we intended to do this and we sought a commercial airplane to shoot.